discuss this topic. The topic, like I said, why was the brutal death of Christ necessary? This is something that I've been thinking about. I had some more time to think the past few weeks. And for about three weeks now, I've been thinking about this question. Why did Christ have to be crucified? The, the title of that sermon, the, the key word there is brutal. Right? We, we might know if you're a Christian, it's probably, you've probably not thought about this very much. I know Christ had to die. As we'll see in a little bit, the wages of sin is death. When you sin, you have to die. But why did Christ have to be brutally killed? Why did he have to be crucified? What's the reason for that? Your instinctual response, at least mine, to that question might be, well, sin's really bad. And since sin is really bad, this terrible death had to occur. That's why Christ had to be crucified. But that's actually not the right answer. The reason is that there are many people who do not believe in God, who do not believe in Jesus Christ, many people who die and enter into eternal death, which is hell, and they don't get crucified, right? So if hell deserves the brutal death, well, then God is not doing what he's supposed to be doing because there's a lot of people who are sinners who do not have the forgiveness of Christ, and they don't get crucified. So the answer isn't, well, sin's really bad, so Jesus had to get crucified. The Bible says that it's eternal death. We won't spend time on this, but the Bible says that hell is what we deserve for our sin, not getting crucified on a cross. On the day of judgment, when there are people standing before God who he says, depart from me, I never knew you, I guarantee you that every single one of them would say, I'd rather get crucified on a cross for a few hours than enter into eternal destruction for eternity. The cross is not what we deserve for our sin. In fact, the physical punishments that Christ endured on the cross were not the thing that intimidated him, if I can use that word. In the Garden of Gethsemane, we see this picture where Christ is sweating like great drops of blood, and he prays to the Father, and he says, Father, if it would be possible, let this cup pass from me. He wasn't talking about the physical cross. And we know that because the people who follow Christ, the martyrs of the church, there's been thousands, millions perhaps of martyrs, and they go to their crosses, they go to their nooses, they go to the firing squad, they go to the pyre where they're burned alive, and they're rejoicing. They're saying, this is great, I get to suffer for Christ. Yet Christ was saying, let this cup pass. He wasn't talking about the physical pain of the cross, he was talking about the spiritual pain. So the cross, the central aspect of the cross is the cup of God's wrath that Christ drained to the dregs for us as children. We don't have to know God's wrath because Christ experienced it for us. That's the center of the cross. But the question today is why the physical suffering? Why couldn't he have just been killed quickly and easily? Why did he have to be brutally killed? That's the question. Uh, Cicero, who was a, a Roman a leader, a political leader, orator. Uh, you've probably heard the name Cicero. He was alive. He died about 50 years before Christ was born. This Roman leader, this is what he said about crucifixion. To bind a Roman citizen is a crime. To flog him is an abomination. To kill him is almost an act of murder. To crucify him is what? There is no fitting word that can possibly describe so horrible a deed. And this is what Christ experienced. So horrible a deed. The worst possible death. Why is that? If he had to drain the cup of God's wrath, why also this horrible deed? Well, what I want to do this morning is give you nine reasons from the Bible. We're going to look at a bunch of verses, more than nine. Nine reasons from the Bible why Christ had to be physically and brutally killed for our sins. The first about seven of these, we're going to fly right through because a couple of them are really, really, that's the core of what I want us to get. So we're going to fly through about seven of them, and then we're going to focus at the end on, on a couple of them. Okay, so the first uh, verse that we need to look at in answer to this question is Isaiah 53. This is the famous passage about the suffering servant. In answer to the question, why? Did Christ have to suffer this brutal death? Look at Isaiah 53, and we'll look at verse 5. 
So before we read this verse, the answer that it's going to provide to us is that it was prophesied. Christ had to experience this brutal death because it was prophesied. It says in verse 5, But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crucified for our iniquities. The chastening for our peace fell on him, and by his wounds we are healed. He was pierced, he was crushed, and he received wounds. This is speaking in the past tense, but it was written hundreds of years before Christ. It's a prophecy, and it's written in the past tense to say, this is so certain that it will happen. Isaiah's writing it in the past tense. So the Bible prophesied there will be this painful physical death. He's not going to die of old age. He's not going to um, have a quick death. It's, it's not that his throat is just going to get slit and it'll be over quickly, but he'll be pierced, he'll be crushed, and he will receive wounds. Uh, Hebrews 9.22 says, According to the law, one may, also say, may almost say, All things are cleansed with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So the Bible in the Old Testament says there is a necessity for the shedding, the physical shedding of blood for forgiveness. Isaiah prophesies that. We see that in the sacrificial system. There's this need for the shedding of blood for forgiveness to happen. So Christ, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, saying, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, he was entering into a conversation with the Father and also through the Holy Spirit. The three persons of the Trinity were discussing uh, the, the, the sacrifice that was necessary for mankind. Yet Christ and the Father and the Spirit did not decide that the cross would be necessary in the Garden of Gethsemane. They didn't make that decision the night before it happened. They didn't make that decision when Christ was in the synagogue and he read the Isaiah scroll and he said, hey, this prophecy about me is being fulfilled in your hearing. They didn't say, the Father and the Son and the Spirit didn't say, well, the cross is going to happen then. They didn't say that when Christ was incarnate, when he was born. They didn't say before he was born, well, let's, let's cause him to be born tomorrow and then he'll grow and then he'll go uh, hang on the cross. They didn't make that plan at the end of the book of Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament. They didn't say, well, the Old Testament's done. We need something new. And, and so they made the plan then. They didn't make the plan when King David was on the throne, who's the ancestor of Jesus. They didn't make that plan when Abraham, the father of our faith, was walking with God for Midian. They didn't make that plan in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve after they sinned. They didn't even make that plan with Adam and Eve before they sinned. But the plan of salvation, the cross, was decreed by God before the foundation of the world. The book of Ephesians says that God's people were chosen before the foundation of the world. And they were chosen through Christ. The theologians call this the pactum salutis, the plan of salvation. This was planned by the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit before the very foundation of the world. And that means that in God's perspective, the cross was on his mind, the cross was planned before he created the first Adam. And that should show us the centrality of the cross. It's prophesied in the Bible. The whole Bible's about the cross, but it's before the Bible, and it's before the creation of the world. Everything centers in on the cross of Christ. So that's the first answer. It was prophesied. The second is that the wages of sin is death. That's Romans 6.23. The wages of sin is death. To sin requires death. The third answer is that the Lord's Supper wouldn't make sense if Christ hadn't died. We couldn't eat the blood or eat the flesh of Christ and drink the blood of Christ, like Jesus says in all four Gospels, if Christ weren't dead, right? So the Lord's Supper requires the death of Christ. The fourth answer is that Christ, in order to fulfill the Old Testament prophecies of his companions fleeing him and him being left alone, he had to endure a physical death that would intimidate his disciples and cause them to leave. We see this in Matthew uh, chapter 26. Matthew 26, starting in verse 31, it says, Then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away 
because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. That's a prophecy from Zechariah. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. But Peter answered and said to him, even though all may fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, truly I say to you that this very night before a rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. All the disciples said the same thing too. Yet as we know, as we continue to read, they were wrong. They fled. There's no New Testament recording of a disciple being at the cross of Christ other than the beloved disciple who is probably John. All the other ones, there's no indication in the New Testament that any of the disciples other than John were with Christ. Peter denied him before the rooster crowed. Why? Why did all these disciples leave him? Why did Jesus' friends leave in fulfillment of the Zechariah prophecy? Well, because they knew what was coming. They knew the Romans were after him, and they knew what the Romans did to criminals. They crucified them. And so Jesus' physical death enabled him to fulfill the prophecy that said he'd be alone, completely abandoned at the time of his death. Galatians 3.13, the fifth answer, says that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And that is a citation from the book of Deuteronomy. Jesus, his physical death, was the manifestation of him being a curse for our sakes. The Bible says it's cursed to be hung on a tree. And so Jesus had to be hung on a tree. A cross is made out of a tree. It was a physical representation of him being a curse for our sakes. That's the fifth answer. The sixth answer is that Christ's physical death affected the removal of the ceremonial law. Why do we as Christians get to wear clothes like I'm wearing where there's two different types of fabric woven together, even though Leviticus says don't wear clothes with two different types of fabric written toge- woven together? Why do we get to eat bacon and shellfish? Why don't we have uh, laws in our government about um, cities of refuge and these things that the ancient Israelites had to deal with? Why don't we have all these laws? Well, it says in Ephesians 2.15, Christ abolished in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might create the two into one man, making peace. He abolished the law of commandments, not the whole law, but the law of commandments contained in ordinances, the ceremonial law, all the laws about the dietary things and the things that we uh, wear. He abolished those how? In his flesh on the cross. Colossians 2 says, Having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, he also has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. There was no man in the history of the world who had the law of God written on his heart like Christ. He perfectly obeyed the law. Every jot and tittle, every word Every letter of the law, he perfectly obeyed it, including the dietary ones, including the clothes that you need to wear, including what you need to do on the Sabbath. He perfectly did all of that. And if God the Father was going to rip up those laws for his children so that we can eat shellfish and eat bacon and things like that, so we don't have to follow those laws, God the Father wouldn't just say, okay, new plan, I'm not going to do the old plan anymore. He had to rip it up. And he ripped it up by nailing Christ to the cross. It was written on his heart, and it was nailed to the cross. Why do we not have to follow these laws? Because Christ, who is the law, who had the law written on his heart, was nailed to the cross. The seventh reason Christ had to be killed on the cross is to provide for us a a goal to strive for. What is our life about as Christians? If you're a Christian, what's your life about? It's not praying some prayer and saying, I believe in Jesus, and then you go out and you just do whatever you want, and you get to go to heaven when you die. That's not the way it works. What's the, what's the brutal death of Christ show you? Well, the brutal death of Christ shows me, well, this is a pattern for me to follow. First Peter 2.21 says, For to this you have been called, since Christ also suffered for you, Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. 
He suffered that you should follow in his steps, 1 Peter 2, 21. So it's an example. His suffering is an example for us. In what way? Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Romans 8.13 says that we are to put to death the practices of the body, meaning sin. We, our sinful tendencies need to die. That's what the cross exemplifies for us. Colossians 3.5 says something similar. Galatians 5.24 says, Now those who belong to Christ Jesus crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If you follow Christ, you've crucified the flesh. That's the sins. You've, you've put your sins so far away, it's as if your body has died. That's part of the point of his death. Matthew 16.24 Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Colossians 3, starting in verse 1, says, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Sit your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth, for you died and your life has been hidden with Christ in God. Listen to that again. For you died, and your life has been hidden with Christ and God. The brutal death of Christ is a reminder to us. Well, I'm struggling with this sin. Should I give in to this sin and make my life a little bit easier? Well, Christ's death was brutal, and that's, that's my trajectory. That's my compass. That's my northern star. And so that answers the question in the moment. Should I give in to this sin or not? Well, of course not. If Christ's flesh could be ripped from his body, I can endure the pain of denying myself the pleasure of this sin. 2 Timothy 2.11 says, It's a trustworthy saying, for if we died with him, if we died with Christ, we will also live with him. And so this death of Christ gives us the direction that we're supposed to go, but then the Bible says, if you follow in that direction, if you die with Christ, if you give up your life for Christ, the Bible gives us this assurance. Well, then also, you won't just participate in the, the pain of the cross, but you'll also participate in the glory of the resurrection. Okay, well, eighth answer, and this is the most important one, I think. If you, if you Take one away, take this one away. Why did Christ have to suffer this brutal death? I think the most important answer to that question, though there's, there's important ones, and by the way, there's more than nine. These are just nine that I picked. But I think the most important reason that Christ suffered on the cross is to prove his metal, to demonstrate that he is the perfect mediator, the perfect savior. Philippians 2.8, let's flip there. Philippians 2.8 gives us a picture of this. This is another famous verse. This occurs in a section where Paul the Apostle is giving what many think to be a, a poem or a creed or even a song about the glory of Christ. And right here in the, in the middle of it, he pens these beautiful words in chapter 2, verse 8, speaking of Christ. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient. Okay, that's, that's the key. He humbled himself by becoming obedient. He was obedient. What, what did Christ do? He obeyed the Father perfectly. No one has ever obeyed the Father perfectly. And so, well, what did Christ do? He didn't just become a little baby and do whatever he wanted. He became a baby, he grew. Every single moment of his life, he was obedient. But notice what Paul says next. He became obedient to the point of death, and not just to the point of death as in he lived a nice life and then was obedient and he died of old age, but he became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. His obedience, Paul is saying here, was not just lifelong, but it was through the cross. He was obedient even on the cross. 
And so the brutal death of Christ shows to us his perfection. Because even in the midst of this horrible death, this death that Cicero, the, this atheistic Roman politician said was so horrible, even Christ going through that, he was still obedient. We're all fam- familiar with what Paul's talking about here, right? It, it's easier to be obedient when things are going well, right? When your belly's full, it's a lot easier to not sin than when your belly's empty, right? They have a word for that. It's called being hangry, right? You're hungry and you're angry, right? Why? It's, it's hard to not be angry for a lot of people when you're hungry, right? When, when things aren't going well, it's harder to obey God, right? We, if you're a Christian and you have a regular devotional practice, if you're a Christian, you should have a regular devotional practice. Read the Bible every day and pray every day. What happens when you get sick? You don't feel well. You're laid up on the bed or the couch. What do you typically not do? You typically don't read the Bible. And typically if you pray, it's like, please God, help me. You know, but you, you're not reading the Bible. You're not worshiping God. Why? Because you don't feel good. What happens when you're stressed, right? You have a really good diet and you don't commit the sin of gluttony, but then you get really stressed out and you eat a whole pizza or a whole box of donuts, right? Why? Because they don't feel good, right? It's, it's harder to resist that sin. Or when you're in physical pain, right? It's easier to snap at people. Right? It happens with spouses all the time. You're in physical pain and you just snap at your spouse. You say, I'm sorry, it's because my back's hurting. I didn't mean that, right? Why? It's difficult, to resist sin when you're not feeling well. Or uh, not doing something wrong, but just not doing anything at all, right? If you experience depression, it's hard to do the things that you're supposed to do, but obedience to God means not just avoiding stuff, but also doing things, worshiping Him, serving Him. But if you're depressed and the chemicals in your brain are weighing you down, your body feels like it weighs a thousand pounds and everything seems like torture, well, it's hard to do the things that God's called us to do. Martin Luther allegedly said, we don't know if he actually said this, but he allegedly said that when he drinks beer, he sleeps better. And when he sleeps better, he sins less. And if you sin less, you go to heaven. And so the moral of the story for Luther was drink beer, right? And we understand what his point was, right? If you sleep, if you have a good night's sleep, it's way easier to resist those sins than it is if you're tired, if you're angry, if you're stressed, That's the brutal death of Christ. That's why it was necessary. He was at the lowest point imaginable physically. He was hungry, tired. He hadn't slept because he was praying all night. He was in extreme physical pain. He didn't have friends there consoling him. And he didn't have, most importantly of all, he didn't have his heavenly father there, the spirit encouraging him. He was at the lowest point point that any human being could possibly be. Yet, Paul says in Philippians 2.8, he was obedient. I don't know about you, but I can't be obedient when I'm doing really well. When I feel good and my belly's full and I'm not stressed and I'm having the best day of my life, I still can't stop sinning. Yet Christ, when he was at the lowest point imaginable, he did not sin. Not even in his thoughts. He didn't have a sinful thought. Mark 15, 23 says they tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. Why? Why didn't he take the wine that they offered him? Because he wanted to experience the pain. The wine would have dulled the effects, and he didn't drink it. Because he had to experience the lowest point possible and be obedient there. He had to be obedient in the most difficult circumstance to be our Savior, to be our mediator. C.S. Lewis says, if a man is walking straight into the wind, and that wind is just beating on him, a a weak man might lie down after 100 yards. A strong man might lie down after a mile. And the strongest man might lie down after five miles. But all those people who have pushed against the wind and walked headfirst into the wind, none of them know what it's like to overcome that pressure. Yet Christ never laid down. He walked and he walked and he walked face first 
into the temptation, into the trial, through the pain, through the abandonment, and never, ever laid down. That's who Christ is. That's what the cross means. That's, that's a little sliver of it. That's why the brutal death was necessary. And he wasn't backed into this corner. Remember, this was the plan before the foundation of the world. This was the pactum salutis, the plan of salvation. Before the first Adam was created, this was the plan. And at any moment, he could have jumped off. Matthew 26, verse 53, Jesus says, Do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions, 12,000 angels? At a moment, he could have said, Send me the heavenly host. Take me down from this wretched cross. Let it be over. In a moment, he could have done that. It would have been so easy for him to lay down. But he didn't lay down. One theologian said, Jesus can be our Savior only because he did not spurn the cross. Had he refused to continue dedicating himself to God's will for our salvation, Jesus, in effect, would have renounced his role as Savior. If even for a moment on the cross, Christ said, I don't want this. This is too painful. I don't want to do this anymore. Give me a little bit of wine to dull the pain. I don't want to go to the depths. I don't want to go to the lowest point. If at any moment he had said that, he couldn't be our Savior. He had to experience the depths, the most difficult thing. Hebrews 2.10 says, It was fitting for him, for Jesus, for whom are all things, and through whom are all things, and bringing many sons to glory, to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. How was Jesus perfected? He was perfected through sufferings. Now, it doesn't mean Jesus was imperfect before, but it means as the mediator, as the Savior, he had to do some things, right? That's why baby Jesus wasn't crucified on the cross. He had to do some things to be our mediator. He had to live the life that we couldn't live. And the book of Hebrews says his perfection occurred through his suffering, through the suffering, through the cross. That brutal death was part of his perfection. The fact that he didn't give up was the crown of his mediatorial work. It is his biggest badge of honor that he was obedient on the cross. He faced Satan in the wilderness, and Satan tempted him three times, and he tempted Jesus while he was hungry. He hadn't eaten for 40 days. As hungry as you can, that's literally as hungry as you can get. You can't go past 40 days without eating, without dying. So what's the point of the 40 days? Among other things, it's maximally hungry. But in his maximal hunger, he didn't give in to Satan. But even that wasn't as bad as the cross. He went even lower than the wilderness. Why? To prove his mettle. To prove that he's the Savior. To prove that he's the one, the only one, who can follow God completely. And that is the abomination of every other religion. That is why we are not people who say, it's okay if you're a Mormon, it's okay if you're a Buddhist, it's okay if you're a Muslim. We all just get along. We all worship the same God. Wrong. Because they don't worship Christ. They don't worship this Christ. This is the king. This is the only king. I don't care how fervently you believe in Allah or Buddha or Joseph Smith. It doesn't matter. This is the king. And all other people, all other systems of thought who say, well, this is another way, this is another path to God, that's a wretched, damnable, abominable heresy. It's something that we should hate. We should look at that and say, how dare they take what Christ did and throw it in the trash and say it's not necessary. We don't need the cross. You can go to heaven by just doing what Allah says or listening to Joseph Smith or finding nirvana. Those are, those are words of warfare. It's not just another path to God. It's treacherous. It's horrible. It's horrendous. Why? Because of the cross. So when you see a Christian who says, oh, it's okay, we are all believe in the same God, that Christian doesn't understand the cross. And if you don't understand the cross, then you're not a Christian. Again, in the book of Hebrews, in chapter 12, verse 2, it says that we should fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of faith. 
who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I love that. He's the author and the perfecter. He writes the faith. He says this is what faith is. But he doesn't just write it down like the Pharisees and say, here's the law, go do it. But he's the author and he's the perfecter. He's the one who does it. He writes down what it is and then he does it. He's the perfecter of the faith. And how does he perfect the faith? By being obedient, even to death on a cross. And then he says, he endured the cross. Right? He wasn't rejoicing in the cross. He wasn't glad about the cross. But the cross was the, the cold stream that Christ had to swim through to get to the glory of God, his kingdom on the other side. He had to go through the cross in order to perfect the faith, perfect our faith. How is it that you and I, these imperfect creatures, can stand before a holy God, who's perfectly holy, who's the same God as Christ who hung on the cross, the same God who doesn't sin no matter what, even at the lowest point in human history, how is it that we can stand in his presence and be united with him? How is it? Well, it's because this perfect faith that Christ lived, it's granted to us. When we enter into glory as Christians, we don't enter into glory as sinful creatures, but we enter into the kingdom of God as Christians, as a little Christs, as people who have been clothed with the very righteousness of Christ. God the Father looks at us, even now, before we enter into heaven, he looks at us as wearing the very righteousness of Christ, the one who perfected the faith, perfected it, And that is what his gift is to us on the cross. The theologians call it the duplex gratia, the double grace, right? It's not just that he takes our sins away from us and God the Father pours his wrath out upon those sins upon the cross. But it's also the second grace is that Christ gives his righteousness to us. That's the only way that we could enter into the presence of God the Father. And the righteousness that Christ gives to us is a perfected faith, the same faith that would not for a moment even entertain a thought against the law of God even on the cross after being whipped and scourged and beaten up until death, that same faith is granted to us. That's what the cross is. That's who Christ is. And not only does that righteousness of Christ, that that obedience of Christ get applied to us, but it also enables him to, to know every single thing that we go through. There's no temptation that we have. There's no sin that we can fall into where Jesus can say, oh, I don't know what that's like. He's, he's the man who walked through the wind, but he never laid down. Right? The man who laid down after a mile, he, can, he's, he can't look at the man who's five miles in and say, oh, I know what you're going through. He doesn't know. He laid down after a mile. Jesus never laid down. So there's no temptation, no thing that we could go through that Christ can't say, I've been there. I know what that's like. Yet he never gave in. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things like we are, yet without sin. This is why Christ on the cross quoted Psalm 22, verse 1. And it's one of the very few places, actually, to my knowledge, there's only two places in the Bible where the Aramaic is written out for us. You know, the New Testament is written in Greek, but, and everything's in Greek, but there's one place, two places, where the Aramaic is presented to us. And that's the language Jesus spoke. And the Aramaic that's recorded for us is a citation of Psalm 22, verse 1. And there's two different uh, um, dialects of Aramaic, depending on which one you're looking at and which gospel. But Jesus says, Eloi, Eloi, my God, my God, lemma, why, sabachthani, have you forsaken me? One of the two places in the Bible where the Aramaic is given for us. And that's a quotation of Psalm 22, verse 1. Why, why does he do that? Why does he say, God, why have you forsaken me? Well, it's because Christ had, in that moment, experienced the lowest depth of humanity to the point that God the Father didn't even help him. It's as low 
as it possibly gets. And what does that mean? Well, that means that in that moment, that was Satan's greatest attack. Jesus Christ experienced the greatest attack of Satan. Satan can attack our physical bodies, but he can't attack our souls. He can't remove the Holy Spirit from us, right? We see that in the book of Job. God's ultimately in control. He says, you can attack his body, but spare his life. So Satan can do a lot, but no one was attacked by Satan more than Christ. And that's why he uttered these words. So all of that leads us to the ninth, point. And this is the, the application of all this. What does all this mean for us? Well, first of all, like I said, it, it means that Christ is glorious. This is who Christ is. He's not some wimpy savior, but he is the perfect man, the God man. But it also means that this physical death of Christ represents to us the love of God. Romans 8 32. He who indeed did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? See Paul's logic there in that verse? He's saying, okay, God the Father has given you his son, and this wasn't like you can loan, you can borrow him for three days. It wasn't like, I'll give you my son, but you gotta treat him really nice his whole life, but I'll give you my son, and he's gonna experience the worst possible death. If God the Father, being a perfect, loving father, is willing to make that kind of gift for us, the logic that Paul says is, well, how will he not also give us all things? This brutal death of Christ, the depth of it, how low it goes, which is as low as possible, is for the Apostle Paul a sign of the height of God's love for us. Charles Spurgeon said that the love of God the Father is like the arms that go to scoop Christ up from the grave. His love goes even deeper than the grave. That's God's love for us. There's a a dangerous thing that some people delve into and they, they say that God the Father suffered on the cross. We don't have time to go into why that's not true, but that's actually a heretical view. That, that's not the case. God the Father didn't suffer on the cross. Only Jesus Christ suffered and he only suffered according to his human nature. However, the Bible says in Genesis verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 5, that when looking at evil, it says, Yahweh regretted that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. Genesis 6. God the Father, grieved in his heart. Why? Because of sin. So God the Father, though he didn't suffer loss because he's perfect, he still, nevertheless, as a loving father, seeing his son being overcome by evil, certainly grieved. A grief that none of us will ever experience. It, it, it's, a, it's a whole different category of grief what God the Father, being a perfect father, must have felt when he saw his son there. I can't imagine anything more terrible than one of my children suffering, crying, and running up to me, asking me to help them, and some, something restraining me so that I can't help them back. And just having to see them cry and see them look at me and, and not know, Dad, why aren't you helping me? And I'm standing there, and they're crying, and they're looking at me, and, and I don't say anything to them. And they say, why aren't you helping me? Why aren't you helping me? I can't imagine a worse pain than that moment. That's what God the Father went through intentionally. Why? Because of his love for us. It's amazing that this God, this one who hung on this cross, who did this for us, who exemplified that level of obedience and that height of love, that's the one that hears us when we speak to him through prayer. When you pray, that's the one who hears you. That's the one that you're praying to. How glorious is it that God has not only done this, but he says, now pray to me. What more precious gift could there be on the earth than to pray to this one who made this sacrifice, who loves us this much? Octavius Winslow said in his song, who delivered up Jesus to die? Not Judas for money, not Pilate for fear, not Jews for envy, but the Father for love. This is the ultimate picture of love. 
And this, all of this, we haven't even talked about the spiritual punishment that Christ experienced. This is all just the physical. All of this amazing obedience and love, it's just part of the picture. In fact, it's a smaller part of the picture than his obedience through the physical suffering, through the spiritual suffering that he endured. This is Christ. This is who we worship. Let's pray to him. Jesus, you are abundantly perfect in every way. You are majestic and glorious. You are the obedient son of God, fully God and fully man. There's nothing you can't do, no love that you have not shown. Lord, we worship you. We pray that you would help us to see the cross and to know the physical and the spiritual suffering that you endured for our sakes. And that as, a, as we recognize that, as we see that, we pray that that would produce great faith in us and that that faith would produce obedience in our hearts as we joyfully take up our crosses to follow Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen.